and I, um, I don't want to explain it for them about what it is that they do. Um, it's just it's a, a program that we have that is have been integrated in our school to be able to help children with special needs to be able to be a part of our classroom. That is one classroom. So anyway, it's a very exciting program, and I wanted to bring it to all of your attention because um, it just is one of those great signs of what is going on in our school. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Tony. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Father. Uh, thank you, Beth, for your invitation. So, why don't we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the You're faithful and kindled in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm just going to chat a little bit about uh, my background, my wife's background, and how we came to support children with special needs in Catholic schools. But most importantly, I hope this is an expression of the Holy Spirit active in our lives and an invitation for you to respond to the Holy Spirit in your life. Uh, I was born in Massachusetts. Uh, this is our family. I'm the one uh, with, the, with the shorts on and the knee socks. So I'm the youngest of 12. And I uh, uh, was very fortunate to be brought up in a strong uh, Catholic household. Most of my older brothers and sisters went to Catholic school. But I, I think we might have run out of money. I'm not sure. I didn't go to Catholic school. I went to a public school. So I had a very different experience growing up uh, educationally than my older brothers and sisters uh, and myself. This is a, a photograph of my Uncle John. This is my dad's brother. He was born in the 20s. And in those days, uh, individuals with special needs or someone with Down syndrome oftentimes were taken from the home. Uh, but very fortunately, my grandparents were uh, prominent citizens in their community. They were able to advocate and keep their son at home. And um, uh, when I was about uh, five or six, uh, my Uncle John moved into our house with us. And it was very, very difficult. Um, my mother had 12 children and an adult with Down syndrome moved in the house. I lost my bedroom. That was the most upsetting thing for me. Uh, so it was something to get used to. But it was very, very challenging because my mother had no support, no training. And she was kind of left to herself to figure this out. And it was very stressful on her, very stressful on the family. And from my point of view as a young person, it wasn't a pleasant experience. It was kind of difficult. And of course, I had a hard time understanding it my Uncle John. In this same photograph, uh, the little girl is my eldest uh, sibling, my sister Ann. And she had a, a daughter with Down syndrome. And um, it was very difficult on her because her daughter Hannah uh, was born with a heart defect and she didn't survive. Uh, she went for heart surgery at Boston Children's Hospital and uh, she only lived about six months, years of age. Uh, they only got to meet Hannah a handful of times. So this is a very sad moment in a, in a family for my sister who is her daughter. So growing up as a young person, um, quite honestly, my experience with individuals with Down syndrome and individuals with special needs was somewhat difficult and not necessarily a pleasant experience for me. It was kind of a profoundly difficult for me. And um, in all honesty, this area of, uh, of life of potential was one that filled me with dread. I always worried that I might have uh, some special needs or some Down syndrome. And I kind of carried that forward in my life. In fact, when I was in college, uh, when my friends were doing volunteering for Special Olympics, I would not do it. Uh, which is very hard for me to, to be uh, around any with special needs because I just felt so uncomfortable. I had some experiences in my life growing up that were not very pleasant. And then one evening, uh, my wife and I went to the movies at the Galleria, and we were waiting in line. And I saw this beautiful couple, uh, a husband and wife, sitting in, in the food court, uh, having dinner. A uh, very attractive couple, dressed extremely well. Uh, the kind of people that uh, someone like me would be jealous of uh, because they look so successful. And with them was a boy with Down syndrome. 
and he was not so stylishly dressed. He had uh, camouflage pants on and a bright orange shirt and a sequined red hat, and he was incredibly animated, and I could not take my eyes off his family because the love that was so obvious between them. That father was in love with that boy. And that mother was in love with that boy. And that boy was in love with his parents. And I couldn't take my eyes off it. And I said to Leanne, this is before we were married, look, look, look at those people, look at that family. And we just stopped and stared. I'd never seen love like that, not in my family. And I said to myself, that's what I want. I want to feel love like that. I want to love like that, and I want to be loved like that. In that moment, all my fears were gone. I felt very comfortable with people, especially when people were down for me, and I wanted to be near them. That was the moment of the Holy Spirit. That was the moment of metanoia, changing my life, preparing me for something I didn't know was coming. So I want to just take a moment to talk about the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our souls. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, makes us holy through grace, which is the participation in the life of God. God's divine life is infused into the soul by the Spirit to heal it of sin and sanctify it. The Holy Spirit brings those gifts that bear fruit. The traditional list of gifts might include wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, piety, fortitude, and fear of the Lord. And the fruits of the Holy Spirit include such things as greater love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, and self-control. Life in the Holy Spirit grows through prayer and frequenting of the sacraments. We can deepen our relationship with the Holy Spirit by asking Him to help us in our moral lives. The work of the Holy Spirit is a lifelong process, often at work when we aren't even aware, developing us, guiding us, bringing us to where He wants us to be. I'm very blessed to have had the Holy Spirit at work in my life, developing me, changing me, preparing me for what God has in mind. And I pray for all of you that the Holy Spirit is active in your life and you become a servant of the Holy Spirit. And there may be things in your life, doubt, painful experiences, fears, which is the Holy Spirit giving you the opportunity to respond. And I pray that you all respond and allow the Holy Spirit to transform your lives. This is Chris, my son. Now, there was something different about our second pregnancy. We had our daughter Mary. She was a Mary Queen of Peace. Chris was different. We tried for about four or five years before we could have our second kid. Very blessed for Chris to come along. And we went in for his 18-week ultrasound. Um, I knew ahead of time. I was worried about my mom. So he had Down syndrome. He had a, uh, a heart defect, very significant. He had three holes in his heart. He had dense lungs, they were underdeveloped. We weren't quite sure if he was gonna survive or be able to breathe. And he uh, had an arachnoid cyst that inhibited the development of his brain. So he was missing about 40% of his brain and he was missing his corpus scholarship. So that was Chris. And I remember looking at that little nose and thinking, he's got my nose. <laughs> right? And uh, the, the, uh, the medical practitioner is delivering the bad news, and I can't take my eyes off him. He's my son. And I said, poor little guy. And uh, the practitioner said, no, 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 no. Don't feel sorry for him. He can't feel. What do you think you're going to do? So my son, even before he was born, is being denied mercy. He's being denied humanity. 
just because of who he was. And I was thrilled he was my son. And that was our first taste of a world that didn't really want Christopher. But it isn't just Christopher. Unfortunately, in the United States, about 75% of pregnancies prenatally diagnosed with a child with Down syndrome results in abortion. Globally, it's about 94%. In some countries, it's 100%. Countries like Iceland and other Asian countries. Individuals with Down syndrome are the most murdered class of human being in the world. There's not even a close sight. But he's my son. And that's all that really matters. And what the tests don't show is how much love he has, how much he brings love to the world, how much his peers love him. That he understands how to pray, that he can receive the Holy Eucharist, and that he inspires the faith of those around him. So this is Leanne. This is on the day that Christopher was born. And she did all the hard work, not me. So she's first. I'm second. She did all the research. You know, the first few years about survivability and medical issues and trying to take care of Chris. But as he got to about four or five, was, where is he going to go to school? Well, he'll go to Mary Queen of Peace, just like his older sister. We didn't go to Catholic school. We didn't know how hard it was for Catholic schools to welcome children with special needs. And the answer was no. So she traveled the country trying to find out what's the best thing for Chris. And she learned about inclusive education. She saw inclusive education in Catholic schools. And she brought me along. And I didn't get it. Because when I went to school, the kids with special needs were in the hallway in a separate room. And I thought my wife was in denial that our son had Down syndrome. But I didn't realize she was four or five steps ahead of me. And so she sat me down on the kitchen table and said, look, I need your help. Watch these videos, read these books, climb on board. And so I did, and Donna, she was right. And inclusive education is the best thing for children like Christopher. And inclusive education in Catholic schools is the very best thing. About 35% of Catholic families have a child with a diagnosed learning challenge. 35%. So the ability of a Catholic school to educate every child in the family is critically important for our Catholic schools to be relevant to our Catholic families. Too many families have children with diagnosed learning challenges. There's about 120,000 children of Catholic families grade age in the Greater St. Louis area. We currently enroll only about 40,000. That's actually pretty good, and I'm being generous with the 40,000, it's probably less than that. But St. Louis is a very special place. A very large percentage of Catholic families send their kids to Catholic schools, more so than anywhere else in the country. It's amazing, it's fantastic. But isn't it a little bit sad to realize how many kids could be going to Catholic school who aren't? It makes me sad. I want everyone to go to Catholic school. There are about 17,000 students of Catholic families, children age, uh, school age children, with a diagnosed learning challenge. So there's only about 4,000 of these children in our Catholic schools. But if you're kind of a math whiz like me, you can see the ratio is starting to drop. That's only about 20% of our kids with diagnosed learning challenges in Catholic schools. So clearly our families of children with special needs and diagnosed learning challenges are choosing a different place to send their kids. There's about 1,714 kids with more severe special needs like my son Chris. When we started our foundation, there was only about six of these kids in Catholic schools. So now you can really see how difficult it is for our Catholic schools to welcome these kids. There aren't any bad guys here. It's just a challenge we as a community in Christ can step up to and try to figure out. There's about 134 children with Down syndrome, school age, of Catholic families in our St. Louis area, and we started only one in Catholic school. This is what the Holy Spirit was calling us to do. This is where you find joy. You get something good to do. 
So we went to work and we tried to bring inclusive education to Catholic schools. So I'll pause here just for a second to share with you a little bit about what inclusive education is. <clears throat> it's educating individuals with physical or intellectual disabilities in the general ed classroom, shoulder to shoulder with their age peers. Whatever individualized needs a student might have are addressed in the classroom and not by segregating students from their peer environment. So they're educated with their peers. Now, different children, based on their stamina, their level of ability, might need some time in, in a separate classroom. But the goal here is to educate all the kids the same way, with each other. Students are educated in the context of an inclusive service delivery model that may include curriculum modifications, support from the general education teacher, peer students, a teaching aide, or a specialized teacher or a paraprofessional. So you support the child to be with them with their fellow students. And this is something that's important that oftentimes the schools we work with struggle with and the teachers we work with struggle with. The expectation is that the student will make progress towards their individual potential as opposed to hitting a standard. When we brought Christopher to Mary Queen of Peace, and he has a profound cognitive disability. They thought, my gosh, how are we ever going to teach Chris to read, to do advanced math, to do science? How is Chris ever going to keep up? That wasn't the goal for Chris. The goal for Chris is just to be the best Chris he can be. And that may look different than the other kids. So this is a, a graphic that might help folks get a sense of what inclusion is. To the top left, that's exclusion. That's what it was like when Michael John was born. They were kept not only out of schools, they were kept out of homes. This archdiocese, the archdiocese of St. Louis, was the first school system of any kind in the United States to create educational pathways for individuals with disabilities. You know, back in the 40s and 50s, we created our special schools. First of its kind. St. Louis has a very proud history of innovating and I'm thrilled to carry on that legacy with inclusive education in our schools. To the bottom left, that's segregation. That's what a special school looks like. A separate building, separate infrastructure for students with special needs educated, not any peer environment, and separate from other kids. But at least they're being educated. Sometime during the 70s, there was some innovation around integration. And that's where you welcome kids into the building, but they might be in a separate room down the hall. That's what I experienced growing up. And I have no relationships because of it. I wasn't socialized. My fears were reinforced because I was separate from these kids. As time went by, some wonderful educators began to show that you could educate children especially successfully more closely with their peers. And that's what inclusion looks like. And it's transformative. Virtually every study since the 70s shows that educating children, especially with their peers, yields better results for those children and their peers. Better leadership development, <coughs> better spiritual development, better academic development. <coughs> and so why inclusion? Well, because of Jesus. Because the Gospels compel us to. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I'm always struck by the physical nature of Jesus' ministry. He didn't delegate his work. I like to think of him walking between the cities and towns, camping out at night, literally getting his hands dirty, healing the sick, and ultimately sacrificing himself on the cross for us. He is a perfect example of how to minister to our brothers and sisters. And if we could do that in our schools, we are making our schools more perfect in Christ by welcoming these children and all of us in the community serving their needs. Catholic social teaching also demands we welcome children with special needs in our schools. The intrinsic value of a human person is based on their formation in the image of likeness of God, not a social contract or utilitarian calculation. 
My son's disability does not make him less of a person or less valuable in the eyes of God. Human dignity is relational. The dignity of a person is based on how they are treated relative to others. If we exclude our children, we are treating them with less dignity. We must embrace them and bring them into our schools and bring them into our community. We must extend preferential option for those individuals that society marginalizes. I can't think of another group of people that society marginalizes more than individuals with Down syndrome and individuals with disabilities. We must have a bias in favor of those who are disadvantaged, disenfranchised, and treated unfairly by systems. This is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate our relationship with Christ, be inspired by the Holy Spirit, and to welcome individuals like my son Chris into the heart of our schools and communities. And so Lee and I started one classroom. We're dedicated to helping our Catholic school button children with special needs. We start by creating awareness through moments like this. We show how inclusion works through our schools. We've got a great staff of expert practitioners that work with teachers and principals. We raise funds and we give all the funds to school. Last year we gave about $260,000 away to our Catholic schools. This year we hope it will be $400,000. We help families who want their children to go to Catholic school. Many moms and dads are petrified of going to their pastor and going to the principal and asking them, would you welcome our son? Because so many are told no. And I can tell you, it is heartbreaking for those families and it drives people away from the church when we say no to their children. We've got to find a way to say yes. We provide consultations to schools, so we get, again, a group of people that work with our schools, helping them put in the systems and process to be successful. We provide professional development. We get these great events all year long. We get a, a strategic relationship with West University to help educate teachers. <coughs> and when we get particular situations that are challenging, we provide access to experts like ABA therapists, behavioral therapists, etc., to help our schools be successful too. This is a busy slide, so I'll try to do my best to summarize it. When you welcome children with special needs, the things you do aren't just for the children with special needs. When you put in systems and processes, it enables your schools to better meet the needs of all kids. For example, Positive Behavior Supports Intervention, or PBIS. It's a multi-tiered model of behavioral support that was derived from Applied Behavioral Analysis, or ABA. PBS is a school-wide initiative that engages all the staff in focusing on positive behavior and being proactive in preventive uh, behavior challenge. This is for all the kids in the school, not just the kids with marking and special needs. Universal Design for Learning is a research-based set of principles that guide the design of learning environments that are accessible and effective for all. UDL makes curriculum more accessible to all learners by allowing them to access and present learning in different ways. It's about adjusting content to meet the needs of the individual learners, all the kids in the building. Peer supports. Peer supports refers to the use of using peers in classrooms to facilitate learning, friendship, and social skills. Peer supports are used reciprocally and are viewed as a partnership between students. This is all the students building relationships, constructive relationships, helping them grow together, support each other. Care team and RTI. RTI is a multi-tiered system of support. They can help learners at different levels. These initiatives cover behavior, social interactions, early intervention, and teaching methodology. These are the soft skills that a school can begin to adopt that help them better meet the needs of all kids. And you, when you better meet the needs of all kids in your school and community, your school becomes more relevant, it's a better school, families want to go to your school, your enrollment improves, and your retention improves. There's no way around it. If you have a better school, you'll be more successful and more viable. And meeting the needs of all the learners in your community is how you do it. So the promise of inclusive education is the promise that we can better meet the needs of every family and welcome all those families back into Catholic education. Too many families are choosing the free option down the street because their perception is that place will better meet the needs of their kids, and that isn't true. I've seen Catholic schools do amazing things for every kid in the family. 
As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so the works of God might be made visible through him. And so it can be with our Catholic schools. We can make the works of God more visible in our schools, in our community, through the inclusion of children with special needs, and create a community more perfect in Christ's name. This year, uh, we financially supported 12 schools and about 50 kids with more severe special needs. And we provide professional development to about 20 schools, which is amazing. It's something else, because when we first started, no one would take our phone, phone calls. Uh, I think we were the least uh, favored uh, nonprofit in St. Louis when we started. But next year, we have 25 schools uh, reaching out to, to help them welcome children with more severe special needs. So we're hoping to support about 70 kids uh, next year. And we're gonna invite all our schools to our professional development events to help our schools adopt those practices in the classroom and school-wide to better meet the needs of all kids in all Catholic schools. And I wanna talk just a little bit about this school. When I started at that kitchen table with my wife, I had hope I had a belief, I had an opinion, I didn't have any facts. We've now worked with almost 40 schools. I have objective data. I know what works, and I know what doesn't work, and I know what makes it work, and what makes it work is leadership. You get a wonderful pastor and a wonderful principal and amazing staff that's making it work at St. Francis of Assisi. A lot of the schools we work with really struggle. A lot of the schools we work with just say no. Not St. Francis of Assisi. This parish and this school is making it work, and it's hard. But you're blessed to have great leaders and great teachers here and great paraprofessionals that are making it work in these schools. This is one of the stars. This is a good one. This is, the, this is fertile soil where inclusion can grow and our families can start coming back to Catholic education. So thank you very much. Father and Beth for all the hard work you do. So that's all I have for you this morning. I just want to share a little bit about where my wife and I have been and where, where we're going and what we're hoping to do. And I'd be happy to take any questions you might have or, or any comments. Yes, Tony. I just wanted to make a comment and let you know that I know from someone else's testimony of a similar type of thing, this is exactly what people are looking for. I have a very good friend who is high functioning autistic. She and I are almost exactly the same age, and I'm her sister in two theaters. And I was, she tries to do inclusion in community theater, gets a ball rolling, so I was telling her about the program when we started it here, and her words, not mine, I wish they would do that at public schools. She wanted to also make sure that it was integrating the kids into the classroom, not just putting them in the corner of the door, but integrating into the whole class teacher. That is what people need to the that I needed when I was a kid, and I didn't get it. And so she was very happy to hear that that's what's happening. And she also said, just for everybody, while the Catholic Church wasn't as welcoming as she would have liked, she said we are more welcoming than other religions. So continue being welcoming. Just up the welcoming factor, and we'll see amazing appreciate those comments. Thank you. And you said something that's important, that there's a notion that public schools just do it better, and that they're doing it the best way. And that's not true. As a parent of a child with special needs, we've been through the whole process. And we've been to the public school where my son Christopher would have been educated. And he was going to be down the hallway in a room. And not really building relationships with his peers. And Mary Queen of Peace, see if I can get there, when we finally got him in, whole different ballgame. These kids are his heroes. These kids are my heroes. They're amazing. They're his best friends. They know him better than I do. They grew up together since they were just little tiny kids. They loved Chris. And he loved them.
love them. And that's all we really wanted. A community. We have, I think, any other uh, comments or questions? I have one. Yes, go ahead. So uh, this year we are uh, supporting 12 schools. 12? Next year, 25 schools are reaching out. But in this area, in Trump County, I oh, I, I don't know. I'd have to. Two. Yeah, but do you know two? Is it two? And uh, every school is kind of a different point in the pathway. Some are many years into it and have a great system in the process. Some are just getting started. Um, a couple of key success factors, you know, having a pastor and a principal who are on board are critical. Uh, and if you have a, uh, uh, a full-time learning consultant with special ed in the background, that's another critical success factor because they really help day to day implement the system and process across the whole school. So those are uh, the things that we try to help schools uh, capture to be successful. Yes, Bob. You brought up this word, a para. Could you explain what a para does? Sure. So um, oftentimes, a child with more significant special needs might need support. So we talk about inclusion as well, providing whatever support that child needs in the general ed classroom. So if you have a child with a particular disability that might need support in the classroom or throughout the day, one of the ways you provide support to that child is through the use of what's called a paraprofessional. And a paraprofessional is a, a teacher in the classroom, in the school, that provides direct support to that child. When you have children with uh, more significant special needs, oftentimes, very early when they're young, they will need direct support. They might need help in the hallway. They might need help in the classroom or going to the bathroom. Paraprofessionals provide that, and they are an essential part of making inclusion work. What's interesting in the classroom, sometimes paras are invisible. And what I mean by that is, they facilitate inclusion, so it isn't just about the child with special needs. It's also about facilitating relationship between that child with special needs and the peers. And so oftentimes at paraprofessionals, you're not quite sure which student in the classroom they're providing support for, 
because they're facilitating that inclusive environment. And that is great because it starts to remove some of that social stigma, creates that inclusive environment that you're looking for. So the paraprofessional job is critical in those classrooms where that young child needs direct support. As children mature, once they get to, say, fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade, oftentimes that level of direct support starts to uh, uh, drop back because they're more mature and because their peers are more mature. And a lot of the work that the parents do are now handled by their peers. That's when inclusion really is this beautiful thing to witness. When I go to Mary Queen of Peace to visit my son, his friends, are, I'll give you an example. We had a class photograph. And Chris was in a bad mood. He didn't want nothing to do with it. And so he was sitting in the gym over there. And he wanted nothing to do with going across the gym to sit with his, his students. His classmates got up and walked over to him and surrounded him for the class photo. And no one told him to do it. That's what inclusion does. And the parents set that example. They facilitate that interaction, they break down barriers. It's both educational and social, and it's beautiful. And in some cases, parents are doing the yeoman's work every day to make it work in the classroom. Thank our, you, Barbara. One of the things our parents do is help with, um, sometimes they need curricular adaptations, so they work with the, with the learning consultant to make sure that the curriculum is on the right level. So you have to meet the child where they are, right? And so that's one of the things. Yes. No, uh, we welcome. It's a great question. So when we started, we were certainly thinking about children like our son Chris. And uh, the mission of one classroom is to help our Catholic schools welcome every child that they're saying no to, no matter what that child looks like. And our ideas of what special needs or significant special needs looks like has evolved quite a bit. We're supporting kids with autism, ADHD, Down syndrome, but also kids with emotional behavioral challenges, kids with trauma in their background, uh, kids from abusive families, children with medical issues, uh, so many children. So if, if, if our Catholic school is struggling to meet the needs of that kid, and they're worried they can't serve that kid, that's our kid. And probably we're working with children with 20 plus different diagnoses, if you will, at this point. So, all are welcome. Harvey was going to share with them a little bit about St. Francis, what sure. this looks like too. So, here we started with um, one classroom three, four, it'll be four, three years ago, I think. Um, and I well, applied four years ago, three years ago. Four. And our, our original needs were really um, we had a child with a significant visual impairment and a child with medical needs that were so significant that she was missing 32 days and a quarter. I mean, it was, it was wow. Um, those were our initial, our initial grant application was support for them. We needed more medical support during the day for one and we needed some um, uh, device support for the other. And um, always the teacher side of it, just educating, educating us. But in recent years, we've seen more and more kiddos um, coming in with um, behavioral challenges due to trauma and uh, maybe autism spectrum disorders. We've seen some of those um, sorts of things and then learning disabilities. So um, our current um, student, we don't have any students with um, Down syndrome here at this time, um, maybe hopefully someday, but um, we don't right now. But we do have um, a growing body of students with various special needs and we currently have um, two para-professionals. Um, one serves uh, two children and one serves one child at the time, at this time. But we have more coming in and, and we are able to, to um, you, know, be, you know, openly invite them and, and um, being able to have great conversations about these things because of one classroom and the supports. Um, and our teachers are learning more and more. We've had a lot of um, help from an ABA therapist that, uh, that um, uh, Tony uh, in one classroom were, was associated with who's really helped us. And 
As some of you know, a few years ago, we put in our sensory lab. This is another great example. Um, our sensory lab, because we've seen more and more sensory needs, and um, because of one classroom and a relationship they have with Maryville University, we have the graduate students in their OT program coming into our school and creating um, instructional videos for our teachers about how to use that space more effectively and how to redesign it to make it safer and more effective for their students. Um, so, so many ways this is really helping all kids and many kids of our population. Um, but those are some of the, of the specific challenges that um, we've had and, and may have resulted in students having to leave our school and that just breaks my heart. And now um, they're able to attend the school where their siblings are attending. Because their, their siblings likely go too, you know? Um, so, um, so all of those things come into play when we think about um, retaining and um, welcoming more and more of a diverse population. Yes. How old were you, uh, if I may ask? At that point in time, I was about 14, 15. That's wonderful. Yep. And that's just the kind of thing you yep. want uh, for your peers. We visited some schools, uh, high schools in particular, that have these amazing peer mentor programs. And uh, they're very well developed programs. And the kids compete to get slots as peer mentors. Yep. And they, they go through a couple of years of training and they are assigned kids and they become familiar with different types of, of challenges and they provide direct support to kids throughout the day. And that experience is transformative for those peer mentors. It influences their career choices, has a profound impact on their life choices going forward. So it's a wonderful thing you went through. I would love to see more of that in our Catholic schools. What school was that, may I ask? Ruby Garden. Excellent, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Tanya Lanigan, and I'm the development. I'm the development director for one classroom, and so many times when we speak to a group like this, they say, what can we do? And um, and so we, we, we are asking you um, a couple of different things. One, if you know of any You know, our services are, are inclusion services within a Catholic school, and not just here at St. Francis of Assisi. You know, your family, your friends, and other parishes. Please let them know that one classroom is available. That the schools are are, are starting and and tussling with their inclusion programs, and to seek us out. Um, if you know of folks who might help us spread awareness about inclusion in Catholic schools. We would love to hear about it. I've got the papers in the middle of the, of the, the table so with our contact information. We would love to hear from somebody, if you know somebody who might be able to help us spread awareness, who, who might have had a child who wasn't able to attend Catholic schools but now is in a position to support us you know, financially, um, support this program financially. Somebody who has a vested interest in this and has the capability. Um, but most of all, we would like for you to pray for us because this is a, a fast-growing mission. There's a lot of challenges. We're growing faster than we can, <laughs> than we can, than we can even imagine. But it's an incredible.
incredibly exciting time. And the more prayers and support that we receive from folks like you um, makes our job much easier. And I know, again, with especially here at St. Francis of Assisi, which has such a wonderful community and a parish community, the more support that you can throw to God and the Father and, and Mary's, uh, Mary's uh, Gary's daughter, who's our parent in second grade, the more support that you can throw to them in many, many different ways, however you can think about it, is much appreciated. I and mean, going back another, you know, we hear, we hear about this, I think that Beth has told us about this. Um, if you know anybody who can volunteer, paraprofessionals don't have to be teachers, a lot of times they are, mm -hmm. but there are many, the, the, the schools need resources but don't have, always don't have the money to do it. That's unfortunately, and fortunately for me, because I think you do, because I, I help raise parish, help parishes raise money, help one question raise money, but that's always the big, one of the biggest challenges that our schools have to expand is financial resources. So what, if you can volunteer, that can help release some of those resources that money can be put against growing the program. So those are a couple of things that we'd like to throw out there and ask for your help for. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah, stewardship is vital to Catholic education. Catholic education is community education, and we need not just tuition, we need our community support of Catholic schools. And um, uh, I've seen communities around the country revive Catholic education when their parishioners, everyone just steps in and makes it a priority to welcome children into faith through their school. Yeah. Yes, Carla. Yes, please. Are we, at, for Beth, are we anticipating to have more kids next year that need this type of help or coming? We apply for our grants every year, and yes, there, is, there are additional. Um, they, Monk Hockey does a wonderful job of ongoing communication with us, and what our needs will be going forward. So, yeah. Well, we have to start getting ready for mass at 11 o'clock, and so Tony and Connie, thank you so much for coming in and for telling us about your services. Come thank, you. Thank, you.